Jones steps up. Ricketts is at the high point. Jones. Aromaterio has a lane. Nicholas Aromaterio, the shot. Scores! Holy jumping! The Italian stallion puts the puck in the back of the net. Mamma mia, Nicholas Aromaterio! So the chief it in and does. Callum Jones reports at the blue light kept in by the skate of Thomas Maya. Maya. Down low on the half course, he swings out of the slot for Potts. Kyle Potts has it, hangs on, now he shoots, scores! Holy jumping! How do you do? Kyle Potts puts the puck in the back of the net. Blocked that shot, and coming the other way is Alton McDermott, he's in on the breakaway, scores! Holy jumping! His grandfather, Paul Henderson, must be ecstatic about that one because Alton McDermott just scored his first career Buckland Cup final playoff goal has been pulled. The Dukes are in the Oakville zone. Zone Elvis swung that around. The Blades are trying to tie this puck up. It goes into the corner. The Blades have a chance to get this out. Elvis will tie it up. Ten seconds. Gilmore has it at the point. It's in. Tips just wide. Seven seconds. It's back in the corner. Ewing's blocking. Three, two, one. The Oakville Blades. Oh! You're watching Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk with Nicholas Fiore. Welcome back, everybody, to episode number 27 of Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk. I'm Nicholas Fiore, the Oakville Blades play by play broadcaster in the OJHL, and I would like to wish everybody a very, very happy new year and a little special guest on today's edition of the show, the first show of 2021, former NHL player for seven years, Mike Zygomanis. Mike, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me on. Looking looking forward to, to chat and hockey and, and life. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And let me tell you, we, we all want to chat hockey since uh, we haven't had hockey for so damn long. But uh, it, it's coming back, and we're going to get into it, of course. Um, obviously, you talk, you talk hockey uh, because you're a host, radio host for Sportsnet, as well as a hockey analyst on Leafs Nations Network and the assistant coach of University of Toronto uh, Varsity Blues and U Sports. But I do appreciate the time and Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year to you as well. Thanks. I appreciate that. And how, how have you been during COVID? I mean, it looks like we're far from far from over this COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, how have you been? Yeah, pr pretty good. I'm, I'm lucky to still be on the air and still working right. A lot of people have lost their jobs and people have had, or have had their hours cut. So we're still lucky. Um, you know, the show's still going and a little bit different setup, right? Doing it from home now um, versus the studio, but um, still enjoying it. Haven't had too many drop connections. It's only happened twice now. Um, but I, I was going in for the start of it. So from March up until June. Uh, but it was tough, right? Not seeing any family and uh, my mom lives by herself. So it was tough trying to take care of her because I couldn't be in, in close contact with her or anytime I'd get her something or, or groceries or any necessities. It was, it was difficult, right? So uh, in June, decided to make uh, the transition to doing the show from home and Sportsnet was great. Rogers was getting all the gear to do the show and on the Opal app and got a laptop a speaker, got a, you know, connection device and it was, uh, wasn't too difficult. So technology standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm FaceTiming with, with Scotty, uh, <laughs> the, the lead host of, of, of lead off. So, um, you know, it's, it makes it a little bit easier when you do have the FaceTime rather than just going on the radio and, and not being able to, you know, see visual cues of, of who you're hosting with but yeah it's it's been a challenge like like everyone else but like i said there's uh there's a, a lot more people that are are having a you know going through a more difficult time than myself well you know what it's an adjustment period for all right and obviously you have to adjust yourself and i i watch uh a few of your colleagues uh tim and sid right every every night i watch them and they haven't even gone back to the studio um buck martinez and and the jays and dan Shulman, they had that studio when 
the Blue Jays came back in the summer, and at least you were back in the studio or still in the studio from March to June, and they didn't even have that opportunity. So it, it, it's one of those, uh, you know, what are you going to do type of things, right? You're there, you're not, at least you still get to, get to you know, do the job, right? Absolutely. Moving, moving on um, to, to your career, you know, I, I know you, you talk about other people on your show and you talk about others, but maybe, you know, lately since you've been retired, no one has talked about you. And that's what kind of this show that I've created uh, in the summer is kind of about us. You know, I would like to speak to former NHLers, uh, even current ones, if possible, and, and um, radio guys, TV guys to see, you know, their journey because they don't get talked about enough. Right. And that's what me as a young guy in the business trying to come up, right? He wants to do um, seven years in the NHL, Mike, uh, 197 games played from 02 to 2011, Carolina, St. Louis, Phoenix, Pittsburgh, and my beloved Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> How long? Um, 2008-2009, Stanley Cup with the Pittsburgh Penguins. I know that that year was a bit of an injury bug year, but needless to say, overall, how could you uh, overall wrap up your NHL experience over that time? Um, a lot of bus rides, a lot of, um, assignments down to the minors, call-ups, uh, cut a lot, told I'll never play in the NHL again. So uh, typical stuff that a lot of guys go through, right? You know, weren't, weren't part of, uh, you know, that, you know, 30, 40% of, of NHLers that, you know, you have your guaranteed job every, you know, every night and, don't have to worry too much um, with your security, with, with how many areas you signed for. So, uh, you know, I only signed the one multi-year deal after my entry level. So every year was, um, you know, the, the pressure was on, I guess, whether it was a year of the minors or NHL, but yeah, I think I counted, I ended up moving 40 times in, in seven, 17 years of either OHL, AHL or NHL uh, any year in, in Europe playing in Sweden, Stockholm. So yeah, it was, um, I, you know, it, it was a great time in my life. Um, I, you know, it was, I enjoyed the relationships I made, uh, the players I played with, the people in the organizations I got to work with, uh, the coaching staffs who would run the teams and management. So uh, in that sense, uh, very fortunate to, to have those friendships and relationships with um, different people from around the world and still talk to, many of them to this day, but yeah, it was definitely when, you, you know, kid growing up in Toronto and you always dream about playing in the NHL and being a pro hockey player. It was nothing of, of what you thought the game would be like. Um, you know, you, you don't, uh, you don't dream about doing the, the bag skates and training camp and the eight hour days of training in the, in the middle of July and, um, the injuries, I had seven surgeries when I played. And uh, like you mentioned in Pittsburgh, I had, my arm was bare, right arm was barely hanging on and had to do surgery middle of January. But yeah, the injuries were, were probably the toughest part of it. Just doing all the rehab exercises and trying to recover. And uh, you know, you just, your, your body just gives out at some point if you, um, you know, if you overwork it and, and don't do the right things or have old injuries and they kind of all added up. And you know, like you said, it was, uh, I had a lot of surgeries, was injured a lot, but you know, I, I did have some good years and I got to play for the team. I grew up watching. I got to play against some of the guys, that, you know, that I idolized as a kid, uh, got to win a Stanley cup with the penguins, got to play a year in Europe. And, uh, you know, I got to play a couple of years in Phoenix, which was, a really neat experience playing somewhere in a, in a warm climate. How, um, how is it, is it, I don't know if the right wording is mentally draining or, or just mentally overall to bounce back from all those injuries though, Mike, because you know, it's like, okay, an injury, an injury, an injury you know, throughout the seasons. But meanwhile, like I want to play a full season. I want, I want to get these points. I want to contribute to the teams that I'm with. How hard is it mentally to bounce back and say, okay, let's stay positive. Let's rehab this and get back on the ice. Yeah, it can be tough, right? We, we've seen guys get injured, and it's sometimes it takes guys a year to get their feet under them again. You know, everyone just says, oh, you have five months of your offseason. It should be good enough. But there's there's a lot more to it. 
And then even when you do come back to playing and you're trying to get back into game shape, usually there's a lot of rehab exercises you have to do. There was a time in my career where it would take me an hour to get ready to go on the ice for a practice or a game. So if you're doing a pregame skate in the morning at 10 o'clock and then another, and then you're playing again at seven or seven 30 later on, it's uh, you know, there's a re- there's the rehab exercises and activation to go on the ice. And then you have a, usually a couple after it just adds on to everything else, right? The training, the video sessions, um, playing, practicing training, then you, you know, trying to get your body ready to go on the ice. It was, it, it is a challenge. And when you see guys that step away from the game, maybe a little, a little earlier than they should be, it, it, that's usually a big part of it, right? Just, it's just so much work to get your body going. So it was, it was definitely a huge challenge. I remember the one year I had hip surgery after my first year in Phoenix. Um, and it felt great. It felt so good. My, my right side that I didn't realize my left one was that bad. So, yeah, so they were both bad. And then my right side was so bad. I was having trouble skating. And then I got my right side operated on and it felt so good. I didn't realize my left side was that bad, but it took me a while to get back on the ice and in game shape and wasn't even ready for training camp. Um, you know, tough start to the season. It was just really hard to get going. And someone in my position who's, who's been a fourth liner and penalty killer and someone further down the lineup, a guy that's in and out of the lineup and, you know, minor league player, you really can't take a game off or a week off or shift off or have a a bad practice. So, you know, there's, there's, I I feel like general, the, the general fan or fan base doesn't see that side of, of pro sports. You, You know, you only see, you know, your favorite player scoring the big goal or making the big play, but there's guys further down the lineup that you usually, you know, they're there to fill in when the top guys are injured and, um, or guys fill in the lineup when guys are out and, you know, you, people kind of, those guys get lost in the shuffle up, but they're, you know, very important to a team and, and just, you know, the, that 09 Penguins winning, you know, Stanley Cup winning team there's a lot of players that would fill in for the five, 10, 15 games from Wilkes-Barre that were, you know, huge for team success, right? Just you have stretches during the season where, you know, you might have a couple guys out, you might have a couple guys not playing great. And those guys come up from the minors and, you know, really give you energy and, and fill the void. And they're really important to winning championships. So, um, you know, I, I was kind of in one of those roles where, you know, just further down the lineup, penalty killer and, um, but yeah, the injuries are, are, were very difficult to, to deal with. And, you know, something at the end of the day, I had a bad concussion and just couldn't return from that. It was, uh, it was really affecting me, um, you know, off the ice away from the game. And at that point that was, uh, you know, the doctors suggested I didn't play anymore. And, and you know what, if people don't have injuries, um, professionally or not, I don't think they truly understand on what goes into it and what goes behind it. I mean, for me, second time on the ice, five years old, broke my main tibia, flip and landed on it. I mean, six years ago, playing semi-professional soccer, freak accident for my left ACL, completely gone, five other tears in it. So nowhere near the level, of course, that you're at, but no matter what level you are at, you know, it does affect everyone different and it depends what, what injury it is, you know, the rehab and all that. So I know I, that's why I have to ask the mentally draining part. Is it really because everyone, you know, has a different effect, but moving, moving forward to, you know, staying, staying in the NHL, playing in the NHL, there's I, if you would agree with me, Mike, there's a crop where, you know, you know, you're not going anywhere. The McDavid's, the Marners, the Matthews, the Tays and, and the Canes and the so on, the so forth, even the Jumbo Joes now and Patty Marlowe's like, you ain't, go, they're not going anywhere, but there's other guys where, you know, maybe even like yourself and a few former NHLers that I spoke to that had to work extra hard to stay in the big league, stay in the NHL on a consistent basis. How hard was it for you? And even in the general aspect aspect to see, you know, these guys that are working their tails off, maybe not always getting the opportunity and being a permanent NHL. Yeah. Well, some guys are given more of an opportunity just where you're drafted. Right. I mean, if you're a first rounder, pretty much you have to prove you can't play. Um, you know, a second rounder, you're going to probably get a, a, you'll get a look for sure. 
Um, you'll maybe get a longer leash in the minors and they'll give you some, uh, maybe a year or two more to, to develop and then pass third, fourth round, unless you do something really special or, you know, you, you bring something different to the table. Yeah. It, it is hard to get that opportunity, but at the same time, you, you know, I've always believed that you make your own breaks and how you do that is through hard work. And I, I've, you know, was taught that a lot with my parents and something they instilled in me is that if you work hard, you know, you will get the bounce, you will get lucky, you will get the opportunity. And, and they're right. It's, uh, you know, some of the tougher years and tougher times of my career when it's uh, the easiest thing would be to give up and, you know, do something else or, you know, go to Europe. That would be, you know, that's, it, it really helps you through those times uh, and it's not easy right when you're told you can't play anymore you're not good enough and you know back to the drawing board back to the minors it's it it adds up on a lot of guys and when you hear the stories of guys that have been in the minors for five six years and and then make the nhl it's really difficult so yeah it's i i understand that side of it uh more more than a lot of players um if you go through it you know you can really help junior players and guys in the minors trying to battle to get to that next level. But yeah, it's, it's not easy, you know, going to camp, getting sent down, you're going into some small city on the East coast or, you know, down South. I played in Texas and San Antonio for a year where huge hockey fans, but hockey wasn't the number one. It was the rodeo and, and the San Antonio Spurs. It was ba basketball and college basketball. So um, you know, playing all these little different towns, Perry, Illinois. So I know what that's like to go down there and bow, battle through that. And it, it's, uh, it's a challenge for a lot of players. So the guys that do do it, it's, uh, it's quite impressive. And, um, you know, a lot of great players were in the minors. They started there. You know, there's a, a long list of, you know, Hall of Famers that were in the minors at one point. And even some of the superstars in our game today, they've, they've spent some time down there. But yeah, it's it's not easy, but if it was easy, everybody would be able to do it, right? <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. But you know what? You know, so, sometimes it could be a blessing in disguise. Yes, you want to play in the big leagues. Yes, you're in the NHL, but you played 574 games in the AHL. And you recorded 442 points. I mean, like you said, uh, Texas, San Antonio, Rochester Americans, where you ended your career, and the Toronto Marlies as well, which you found. What were the numbers? Yes. What were the games and numbers? I don't even 574 know. 574 games played in the AHL. 574? Okay. And uh, 442 points. Okay. Like, hey, okay. Wow. That, that's, okay. Not, that's not damn bad if I don't say so myself. So, you know, like, that's what I mean. Like, sometimes, yeah, you might not be there, but the numbers are there. I mean, 155 goals, 287 assists. You know, you contributed with the AHL teams, needless to say. How, how do you think your, your experience went overall with the AHL? Did, and did you have one team, which maybe I can selfishly say the Toronto Marlies, but did you have one AHL team where you said, okay, this is like kind of like my home, my, and I really excelled in that market? Yeah, the Marlies was a great setup. Just being from here and being able to live at home, it was a little strange at the start. Just waking up in my own bed and going down to the rink, right? Usually I'm I'm used to packing up the car and, Absolutely. getting ready and leaving for you know seven eight months right and going to a city and place where i don't know anything and then having to rent a, an apartment and get set up with furniture then move your whole life and then pack it all up and move it back home for the summer so it was a little bit strange the first you know season but uh, you know the marley's was a great place to play um mlsc is a great organization I, I and i can compare my time with the marley's to uh, some of the nhl setups it was that professional with, you know, on the playoffs, getting us private planes to travel to games. Um, everything was first class. A lot of the meals were all covered at the rink. Um, training programs, therapists, nutritionists. We had everything, right? Athletic therapists, massage therapists. It was really next level and, and very few teams in the AHL do get, the players do get treated that, that well as we did with the Marley. So, it was, you know, a huge thrill to live at home, getting time to spend with my family. And, uh, you know, my time here was, was great. And, you know, uh, all that a lot to, um, you know, the Leafs organization and uh, Dallas Eakins, who, who was a coach for my time here. Um, obviously, you know, that, that's a, that's a precious time as well, but 
you know, if you didn't want to play, if you couldn't play as much games as you could because of injury, but needless to say, Mike, you have your name on the Stanley cup and it's as simple as that, right? 2008, um, 2009 with the Pittsburgh Penguins, as you can see right behind me there, that's probably a, uh, <laughs> that's probably, that's probably a moment that simply, right? Mike, you, you, you'll never forget at the end of the day, you're part of the team, you play games, Stanley cup is a Stanley cup. And what was that feeling like for you? Yeah, it was great. I, I didn't play in the playoffs, but was out there practicing with the guys. Coming, made it back from uh, shoulder reconstruction surgery, and um, yeah, just being there for the whole process and, and seeing what guys do and what it takes to actually win. It's um, you know, it's not easy. Uh, great team, well coached, great management, great ownership, but so many things have to go right for you to be in that position and then to actually win. You got to right things have to happen at the right time in the playoffs. You need big saves. You need big goals. You need big efforts from guys that, you know, might, you might not look to throughout the season. And the team had all of that, right. It was a great, you know, group of guys. And I got to go back for the 10 year anniversary a year ago and, well, two years ago, almost now. So yeah, that was, uh, that was a thrill to see all the guys again. And, and most of them were there, and, you know, nothing's really changed. It's still the same guys. Some are still playing, some are retired, some are in media. Well, you got to, you got to play with some big guys though, Mike. I mean, Malkin, Crosby, yeah, uh, Jordan Stahl, Sakura, like the list goes on and on. I mean, Goligoski, Gonica Orpik, there, there's, there's a big crop there. Um, that, that team was basically set up to win. Let's be honest that year. Yeah, it, it was. It ran into a bit of injury trouble in December and January. And, um, you know, they retooled the whole coaching staff. Uh, you know, Bilesma came in, Dan Bilesma came in halfway through the season. Um, and just guys started to, you know, to turn things around. I think there was one point where we were out of the playoff picture, um, believe it or not. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's never kind of too late. As long as you don't, you know, put yourself too far out, you can – you know, make a run at getting in the playoffs. And the team went on a bit of a tear after, you know, after February. And, um, you know, the playoffs, that run wasn't easy. Um, you know, there was, there was times where, you know, we th thought we were out of it and didn't have a chance, but somebody would always come up with a big play or a big goal. Um, but, yeah, it was, a, it was a great team. Like, you look at that roster and, you know, I, I'd be on the bench some days, um, you know, the 20 some odd games that I played, it was, you know, some days you just, you kind of look down the bench and you, you wonder kind of what, what you're doing there. <laughs> so, like, yeah, you know, I like, mean, it, it happened a couple of times. It happened a couple of times in my career where, you know, you just, you kind of, you sit there and you, you say to yourself, like, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Like, the, this is it. This is, this is what you played your whole life for. And, you know, exactly. so I get to play with some great players for sure. Well, you know what, hey, Mike, you know, 22 games that season, you know, you, you got a couple goals, got a few assists. At the end of the day, you could be looking left and looking right. You got the championship no matter what. I mean, in my opinion, yeah. people dream to get there and, and, and get, you know, on the ice. And for you, you're probably saying, because you're probably hard on yourself as what I've noticed a lot of NHL players are. Yeah, you know, I wish I was here all the time. I wish I was never sent down or I wish I was playing all the time. But guess what? At the end of the day, you're there. And a lot of people, you know, dream to be at your spot and not only that, but win the cup. Right. And, yeah. and you're there. So at the end of the day, so, you know, it, it, it's almost like an is what it is thing. And I know you're definitely grateful for it for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, the 13 years I played pro and the four years of, you know, junior hockey, I got to play. It was, it, it was great. And yeah, getting the name on the cup was, uh, you know, something really special and, you know, got to go with the team the next year to the White House and, and meet the president and do all that. It was, it was a thrill. And, you know, I know Ray Shiro and, and who was the general manager and Mary Lemieux, um, one of the owners, um, you know, fought to get my name on the cup because you got to play, I think, 50 regular season games or, or one game in the finals. So they were, you know, there are exceptions that are made and usually the team has to reach out and, you know, they, they did that with the league. So I'm, you know, very grateful for that. And yeah, I'm not going to, can't complain with when your name's put on the Stanley Cup. No, absolutely not. And, and, that, and that's definitely, um, I think you won't take for granted and will never, because it's, it's a life, it's a life uh, changing thing, right? That's for sure. 
Another life-changing thing is obviously representing your country as I'm wearing the World Junior Canada long sleeve um, in the gold medal versus the USA. What um, you represent your country as well in 2001 World Juniors, um, winning a bronze medal with the team. How was that like for you? Not just winning the medal, but you know, being with the team at a World uh, Junior tournament. Yeah, it was great. So it was in Moscow. And I was at the camp the year before, end up getting injured again, um, the day of the last cuts. And yeah, I completely tore my groin and, you know, had the coaching staff come in and saying, you know, you're on the team and you're flying out the next day. So, but yeah, so that was kind of tough the year before getting injured and then going back for my actual world junior, my, you know, 19, 20 year old year. Um, you know, camp was a little bit tougher. It was a new coaching staff came in and I ended up going as a 13th forward. So didn't get to play a lot. Um, you know, a couple yard shift here and there. Um, I think one of the games, I don't even think I got on the ice. So it, it's difficult because I'm used to playing 20 to 25 minutes a night with my junior team. And then you get there and all of a sudden you're playing two minutes a night. So it's an adjustment to make, but there's players this year that are making the same adjustment, right? Whether it's a, uh, you know, by field that, you know, he's playing 25 minutes a night in Sudbury. And then all of a sudden he's at the world juniors and you're on the fourth line. It's a, it's a huge adjustment, right? So there are players that are doing that this year and they're going to keep doing that. But the, the year we did win the bronze in, in 01, it was, it was a, it, I would say the world juniors is right up there with making the NHL and winning the Stanley cup. You know, I grew up you know, as a kid watching, waking up early when the tournament was overseas in Europe and, you know, you're watching games at 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. And, um, you know, I'm trying to think of names like a Jerome McGinley. I, I grew up kind of watching him. I know he's not much older than me, but he was a big name. I remember watching him and, um, you know, it was uh, – I mean, there's dozens of guys, you know, I got to actually play against and, you know, watching them as a kid, but yeah, you, every guy, every hockey player, every kid in Canada, they, you know, you want to play in the world juniors that, you know, you want to play on that stage. So that was, uh, it was a thrill for me. My parents got to come down to Moscow and, and watch as well, but yeah, the bronze medal, it's, it's a weird thing, right? I think the gold and the bronze are, are great. And the silver is like, <laughs> could be the worst thing right because we were pretty happy when we won the bronze we beat sweden in in overtime right well they so, say they say mike you know you 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 win the bronze but you lose the silver yeah you lose the gold, absolutely. Right? You lose the gold and you win the yeah. silver. So it's like yeah where, yeah where, yeah where's the level right but you also yeah. with, like Lund, jamie lundmark Cal, camilleri mike camilleri um jason spezza danny heatley you played with guys, you got four points as well um, in that tournament, Brad Boys. How, how was it for you just representing your country in its own? Yeah, it was great. I, I played for Team Ontario under 17s. I played for Team Canada under 18s in, in Bratislava the year before that. So it's it's always a thrill. You know, anytime you get to put on, you know, the Canadian the Canadian jersey, it's 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 really special and you know, it's a, it's a bond you, you share with those guys forever and it's disappointing not to win the gold. Um, definitely, you know, one of those goals you make as a kid is, is to win the gold at the world juniors and obviously make it, but then, you know, there's a certain, you know, expectation when you go to the world juniors and Canada's won so many gold medals that there is so much pressure on, on us that year and on every team every year. Right. If, if so you don't your, win the gold. So what's your prediction? USA versus Canada, 2021 gold medal game. Are you, do you yeah, have one? <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, you know what? They've looked, they've looked good. Um, Canada's look great. The U S team, they have some snipers as well. Good goaltending. Um, really, they don't give much on the back end, but yeah, team Canada. I, I, they played a perfect game against, uh, uh, against Russia. I mean, I, 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 I really, yeah, I really don't know what Russia could have done. It was it, very rare. Can you say, you know, a, a team had no chance of winning. Um, they came in early. They, they got to Russia early, got on the board right away. Um, just hounding pucks, jumping on, um, you know, 
jumping on loose pucks in the corners, open spaces, you know, were physical. The defense was patient, didn't really run around everywhere in their own end, um, took chances and jumped up when, when it was available, but, you know, didn't really play. Uh, there wasn't a lot of risk to their game. Um, goaltending was great. You know, um, it really was a perfect game. If, if they play the same way, um, you know, they're, they'll, they'll win it for sure. Um, it's just, it's tough to play perfect games like that every, you know, every single night. Uh, Russia had a great team, you know, they, uh, you know, good enough to win gold for sure. Um, but when the Canada, the way they played, it was literally impossible um, for the Russians to, to beat them last night, but I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be, you know, this UST, this USA team is, you know, they look good. They got, uh, you know, a quick team. They play fast. Uh, they got guys that can finish and, it's it's going to be exciting. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, let's move on here, Mike. With uh, being a leader, you're a captain with the with Kingston in the OHL. Um, the third and fourth year, if I'm not mistaken, of your uh, OHL four year tenure. Um, what is it like to be a leader? And and you know how honored were you to just have a C on your chest? Yeah, it was it was a huge honor to be a captain of the Front X Front X uh, for a couple of years. And uh, I enjoyed my four years there. It was, I still go back every year and, and visit friends there. And uh, it's, you know, I, I enjoy going back and, you know, hanging out in the city and I, you know, I miss it. And it was a, a great four years of my life. I got, I went to Queens my last year. So uh, I don't say I lived the university life for a year, but <laughs> no, I was on campus and hanging out there. So I kind of had that other, you know, a place to kind of get away from hockey if I wanted and, you know, just go on campus, go to the library, hang out, do schoolwork. So that was made my last year. Um, you know, it was, it, it was nice to, you know, have that outlet where I could kind of relax and, and get away from the hockey if I needed to. But yeah, being a captain is, you know, it's, it's never easy. It's um, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're relied upon, you know, you relied on every night to, you know, bring leadership on the ice, off the ice. Um, I was never the most vocal guy in, in the room. So, uh, you know, you're, you're learning too, right? As a 19 and 20 year old being a captain of a team. And, uh, you know, I, a lot of it, I, you know, had never been a captain before it, at any level. So, you know, to be a captain there, you're kind of learning on the go as well. And we, we had good, leadership group at the time so I didn't need to be the most vocal in the room and just try to you know do all my talking on the ice with my play and you know just try to be a good teammate but the guys that I played with was there all four years were great even as a rookie when I came in as a 16 year old and and the leadership groups were were great my third and fourth year and they kind of I'd, I'd say they were the leaders you know of the team it wasn't just uh you know it wasn't just myself Absolutely. Moving uh, before we move on to some staff stuff, uh, Mike, what, what's your um, what's your favorite your favorite hockey moment in your career, playing wise? Ah, uh, the under seventeen was really special. We won the gold medal in in overtime over the Czechs, I believe it was. Uh, I'm pretty sure um, it was just a great. That was just a great experience your first kind of taste of, you know, international play and you're coming together with all these other players you're playing against, you know, in the OHL. Um, so that was that, that memory, you know, stuck out to me a lot. Playing my first game was, was big. It just, I don't know if you don't, you know, you dream about getting there, but once it happens, it's almost an out of body experience, right? It's, you know, you're, you're actually there and, um, you know, the game was so fast and it was not what I expected at all. Um, so that was, uh, you know, I got to score my first game. So first goal, first game, uh, you know, making that phone call home, my parents didn't get a chance to fly down to Phoenix, but, um, you know, they, they watched the game and I got to talk to them after. So that was a, you know, a big moment from my family and, and friends, you know, a lot of people helped me get to that level. And even if it was just that one game, it, you know, would have been worth it. The Stanley Cup was was really special. Uh, didn't play, but uh, you know, just you know, playing with the Penguins that year and and being around the guys for the playoff run, um, you know, that was you know something I'll never forget. And I guess 
stand in the blue line for the home opener in Toronto. Um, they said I was from North York. I'm actually from Scarborough, but I guess I was born <laughs> in North York, but they said from North York. So, um, you know, I like to usually just leave it as Toronto, but just beat on that blue line, you know, the starting lineup for not starting lap, starting, uh, you know, the roster yeah, I guess, yeah, you're just, you're, you're, you know, you know, the way it's done, you, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we play uh, the home opener is always against uh, Montreal, right, every year. So, yeah, that was that was a big moment, having my family and friends at the game and, you know, just being there when they when they call your name to start the season. Absolutely, and it's something that, you know, you just, like you said, you can't take for granted, right, no matter uh, what uh, circumstance and how many games you get the opportunity to play in the NHL. But moving on to, you know, after hockey and after the NHL, you see a lot of, a lot of former NHL players, former sports athletes in general, uh, move to the TV radio broadcasting side. You move to the radio side. Um, what made you interested in radio, in Sportsnet, and what gravitated you uh, that wanted, wanting to be a broadcaster? I had a couple of friends that were doing it, and they enjoyed it. It was, it was something they were doing once in a while. Either it was just analysts hits for games, you know, afternoon talk shows. And I, I had done a couple, um, uh, you know, a couple years after I was out, out of the game and then reconnected with, with some people I knew in the business um, on the radio side. And I would just go and do, you know, leaf morning skates, um, you know, what we were calling it. I would go in for an hour and discuss the leaf game that was going to come up. And, and then from there it, I would fill in for hockey central when guys were doing late night games the day, the night before on, on hockey night in Canada or sports net. And I would fill in at that on that noon show. Um, and then from there I would, I would do Leafs pre and post on uh, with Gord Stelic. So, you, you know, you go in at six 30, talk about tee up the game and then you go on at the intermissions and then you'd, you'd wrap it up at the end. So it was a lot, right. It was about a year and a half of that, just learning the business, learning what it takes to, you know, talk on air and you know, try to add value and, and make it interesting for the fans listening to the game and breaking down different plays. So, you know, you got my reps in there and, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's, I, I don't want to say it's, it's not a fair part of the business, right. Cause I know a lot of, you know, people that are interested in broadcasting and journalism, it's, you know, usually you go to school, you go to college for a couple of years, then you're an intern for a number of years. Yeah. You, you're going through it. Right. So I, I, I can, I can imagine, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like a, an athlete steps off, you know, away from their game and they just kind of walk right into something. But um, it, it wasn't that, uh, that simple as, you know, stop playing and then and going on a morning show at 6am, but, you know, I'm definitely fortunate and, and blessed to be able to be in the position I was and the opportunity I was given, um, you know, without going to college, without, you know, the reps that, that most people have, or, you know, you, you go and do an internship somewhere and, um, you know, you, you kind of get your foot in the door that way. So absolutely, the opportunity I had was, you know, very privileged and, um, you know, unfair, you know, in a sense, but, you um, not as easy and uh, I didn't adapt to the broadcasting side of it. Just, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes. I, you know, work with a coach and I listen to hours of, you know, other stations that I'm interested in and, and different hosts and different analysts and whether it's in Canada or the U S or sometimes not even sports related, um, just trying to learn the business and, you know, learn what works and what makes an entertaining show. Right. Cause at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, I, I feel like the listener or the, the viewer wants the, uh, you know, the fan wants more than just breaking down a play, like what's going on behind the scenes. How did it relate when you played and, you know, trying to incorporate some stories to make it interesting. I, I honestly, I actually, I actually appreciate you saying that because there's a lot of, you know, people, including myself that went to, you know, school for three years and knowing what you want to do for your whole life. And, you know, you're at a stage now, but you always want to get to the next level, next level, but you gotta, you gotta grind it out. Right. And a lot of these yeah. former athletes, you know, are coming in and, and doing it. And I appreciate you understanding that it's like, 
okay. So it's not, it's not everyone that's saying, okay, I'm going to, after, after hockey, after soccer, after basketball, I'm going to be an analyst and a reporter right away. But you actually understand that side of it, which uh, not, not many do. I mean, I, you're not allowed to say that, but I was like, not, not many do. Right. So, um, but you know, it's all about how much you want it and how much you want to work for it. Just, just like myself doing stuff like this. Right. So it is what it is, I guess, but you got to work your, you got to work your, your, your butt off and then try to get to where you want to get to. And obviously, you know, you, you're working hard also because you're not just a radio guy, you're a, a coach as well. Um, you took some time off. Um, if, in, if that's what I know anyways, for about three, four years, um, since you stopped playing from 2014 to 2018 in the hockey side, the hockey aspect. And then you started coaching with the uh, university of Toronto, the varsity blues. Um, you have a four, few former Oakville blades players, that are on your roster now, Kyle Potts, um, yep. Aiden Davis, uh, good kids there, good players there. I know, I know Potsy is a, is a funny guy if you don't know already, but yep. um, what, uh, what gravitated you back into the game and specifically into coaching? Yeah. So before I, I started at, at the fan and sports net, I was assistant coaching at UFT and it's not a full-time position. Uh, I don't get to be there at every practice and every game, but, I'd say I'm there 80% of the time, 90% of the time. And yeah, it was, uh, you know, I just kind of reached out to them, reached out to Ryan Medell and we had a couple of conversations and he was looking for someone and it just kind of fit, you know, the right way. And, you know, it was a good fit for both of us and I was able to do the radio at the same time. And um, it's been a little bit more challenging with the morning show because I can't go on the road for weekday games and, you know, I'm usually, sleeping as soon as a Leafs game end or sometimes I fall asleep and at eight o'clock and then all of a sudden I'm up at four and trying to watch the third period of a game so uh, lifestyle is a little bit different but yeah it, it's been great the the students and players have been awesome to work with um, all two and a half years now and I, we, we've taken some time off with the pandemic but we we actually got out to some practices uh, you know a handful of practices this year and it's not looking like there's we're going to have a season, but maybe some chatter about doing some kind of like mini tournament. But it's been a great, you know, great experience there. UFT's very welcoming and uh, working with uh, Ryan Medell and Andrew Dovey, the other assistant, you know, the other coach. It's It's been I'm learning a ton and it's something I'm happy. I, you know, I, you know, it's something happy I'm, I'm a part of because, uh, you know, I, you never know, right? You never know how long you'll, I'll, I'll be, you know, on the media side of things. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, coaching's always been a passion of mine. And it, right now it works out perfect, right? Doing the media and, uh, you know, doing some coaching on the side and, and, and get to, you know, still go out on the ice with guys and practice. I, I enjoy the development side of it and, and some of the systems and, you know, even more than the games, just, uh, helping guys you know, craft their, their game. And they still have, you know, pro aspirations when they're, when they're done, um, they're done their school T right. So uh, you kind of give them the, you know, a little bit of help and cause they're so close, right. It's, it's a, a lot of the guys in our team are, it's a, just a fine line between making it pro and, and not making it. And it, it's great that these guys are getting education and, can take a run at you know the east coast or europe after and you never know because guys do make the nhl out of canadian junior or canadian um university hockey so um that's uh you know some guys still have that you know hope at the end of their you know their university days that they can make a run at that absolutely and finally uh mike in, in your opinion how, how do you think the game has changed from when you came into professional hockey into the nhl even even when you retired um, in, into the game now and nowadays. Yeah, the game, the game's changing every couple of years. It's getting faster. Uh, the players are in better shape. They're getting stronger, um, smarter equipment's getting better. Um, the goaltending's probably the goaltending for me and coaching are the two biggest things. Um, you know, no disrespect to the goaltenders or coaches from decades ago, but those two areas, I feel like they've improved the most. Um, whatever kind of rule change you make, the coaches are going to figure it out in a year or a year and a half. Like I can guarantee you they'll figure out 
three on three overtime. They'll figure out any kind of rule change. Um, you know, they're now that video is a part of it, you know, 20 years ago when I kind of broke into the pro scene video, wasn't that big. You know, I talked to players in the mid nineties and they would barely watch any video. So now it's so detailed. There's so many coaches, so many development staff on each, in each organization. The goaltenders are, are better. They figured out the equipment wise on what works and, you know, the NHL is always trying to cut it down for them and, and make, you know, they want more goals. So they're making it tougher for the goaltenders, but these goalies are so athletic, you know, it's not the, the days where, um, you know, uh, goaltenders were, you know, it's, the, the, it's just, it's changed, right. These guys are athletic and, you know, some of the guys, the goalies I played with could probably play, you know, a, a player position. They're just good skaters and in great shape. So, um, the game's really changed. It's going to keep changing. It's going to keep getting better. So uh, they're going to have to keep tweaking rules. And, you know, I know they talk about making the ice bigger and, but it's uh, I think it's a great product right now. It's exciting to watch. There's lots of goals um, and, you know, it's, it's only going to get better. Who's in, uh, who's in the Stanley cup final this season? What's your prediction? <laughs> a week, oh. a week or so before the season starts. Who, who's who's the favorites? Who do I like? Um, Who do you like? I like Toronto coming out of, uh, you know, the, really? the North Division. Yeah, I think I'll take Toronto's. It. I'll take it. <laughs> so we'll, we'll go, we'll go, Leafs and. So are they do so the what how, have they decided how they're doing the finals yet or are they just going to slot them one through four based on I, where I they think that's what the plan is for now they're going to have a a division winner that's going to come out yeah division which we know and then i think it could be uh seeding wise who is they'll the best uh who had the best regular season Simple. And then they'll Coming see the over. last four. So yeah, it won't be a bracket situation where it's no. um, you know, the north with the west or central with the no. east. Um, no, so teams I like, I, I mean, I, I think the avalanche are poised to to do some damage. Yeah, I think McKinnon is the most dangerous player, and he just I mean not only is he one of the most skilled and you know best skaters in the league, he yeah, he's showing something else that doesn't show up in stats and analytics, um, you know, call it heart, call it the will to win leadership. I mean, you can wrap, you know, all of those, I guess, all those tangibles together. It's, there's just, there's more to him than the stats and the point differential between him and the next high score. I mean, you can look at all that, but um, you know, he just, what he does and, he, he can bring a team and put a team on his back. And that's kind of what I look for in teams that, that go all the way and teams that win are there's usually a, a one player, or a handful of players that can really pull their team along when, you know, a game could go either way or a series could go either way. Um, you know, and, and he can do that. He's so good enough. Tampa, so I'm sorry, Mike, are the, are the Tampa Bay Lightning going to be celebrating on boats again or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it was great to see them win i mean that's that team put together is i uh, the amount of talent on that team and they have everything right headman on the back end kucherov stamp coast up front they have three lines that can score uh vasilevsky and that i mean if you want to put a all-star team together tampa bay is definitely there but look how hard it was for them to win right Exactly. And how much trouble they've had. I mean, they, they got swept in the first round a year ago. It's it's literally that hard. And they probably had a better team two years ago. Um, but I feel like I've always been big on teams with three lines that can score. I know we all talk about top six. I'm in, on, on our morning show with Scotty. He always brings up the fact when I, <laughs> when I always say it's not top six. I mean, you need a top nine. Like, who are your top nine? There's no more tops. So you want to know where the games change a little bit. It used to be a top six with a grinding line and then a fighting line that didn't play. The game has evolved and changed where um, another team I like is Vegas. Uh, I, I think they, what, what they've done there and what they've established uh, as an organization and who they've put together their expansion draft and, you know, going to the finals and 
you know, they probably even better two years ago, they had a better team. So it's, I think they have a chance to win it as well. Um, but they have, a, they have extremely talented top three lines, right? They have three lines that can go and score anytime. And I think that's what's important. I wouldn't just look to stack two lines, the T. So look, look what Tampa did. They, they got a little bit, uh, you know, they, they got a little bit rougher on the edges, you know, guys that can, you know, play physical and play with a little bit of crag, we say, um, you know, um, but can score at the same time. And Tampa did that this year, right? That was something that was missing in their game and, and they found it, they found the right mix and yeah, they can, they can repeat, but I, I like Vegas. I like Toronto. I like Colorado. Um, Dallas, I said all year would be great. Um, I thought Philly was going to last a little bit longer than they did. Um, they're more than capable of making a run. When the Leafs played Philly and Colorado last year, they were probably the two best teams at the time. I thought they were the two best teams um, that I'd seen. So, um, yeah, the the parity in the league it's it's tough. It's it's not easy to win. Um, you know, it's it's you know, soon to be thirty two teams. It's going to get even harder. So, um, you know, it's how consistently can you play throughout the season? Can you keep guys healthy, keep guys happy, keep improving throughout the year? Just add one thing, um, you know, your, your systems down. Um, you got to get guys to get hot. You need, you need MVP performances. You need, you need players to, you need, you need players to have great years. And it's not a selfish thing. I, you know, I, I try to tell guys when we start at UFT, we need players to have, you have to have career years. You have to, you, you, it's not a selfish thing. You want, you need players to go out there and do well, score goals, play well defensively, right? You, you need great individual efforts to win. It's not just playing a system and everything's going to be great. It's, it's, it's not that simple. You need players to go out and have great years. And, you know, that's how you're successful. Absolutely. And let me tell you something. Well, a few things. If you're a Vegas fan base member, let me tell you something. Not having one bad season yet coming into the league. My Absolutely. goodness, my goodness gracious, they don't know what our what us and my, uh, my uh, us league fans uh, uh, go through uh, year in and year out. And and can you know is Jumbo Joe gonna have a jumbo effect on on the Maple Leafs? Uh, you can use that for the show, no problem. No problem. <laughs> because uh, you know, I, I hope he does, and it's. I, I thought, talked about it to a few buddies the other day. Imagine the Leafs now have Jason Spets up, which you've played with, uh, um, Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe, who they used to have. Imagine those three guys on the Leafs in their prime. Oh, my goodness gracious. It'd be something special, right? And then we all want the Leafs to do good, but we, we just want hockey to come back, Mike. And it's going to come back in, a, in about a week's time. And I'm sure uh, you're going to be covering it galore on the show. But I appreciate you coming on my show. And what I've started here, um, no matter if you've played 1,000 games, 800 games, 100 games in the NHL, sometimes guys like yourself, you know, don't come on, you know, a podcast or a show like mine too, uh, because it's just it's just the way it is and the way the world is. But I do appreciate you taking the time uh, coming on. And, um, you know, best of luck uh, with your show and everything moving forward. Thanks a lot for having me. It was great chat. Absolutely. And, and, and the, the best chat is the hockey chat. And I appreciate you coming on once again. Everyone, former NHL player, seven years, and 11-year pro in hockey, Mike Zigermanis, who's currently a radio host for Sportsnet, as well as hockey analyst on Leafs Nation Network and University of Toronto Varsity Blues assistant coach. I'm Nicholas Fiore, the broadcast host of the Oakville Blades. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate your support. Follow on all social media platforms. Next week, another episode, episode 28, with another former NHL player and some ties to the OJHL as well as an Instagram live next week with a former Oakville Blade. Thanks for tuning in. Happy New Year and Mamma Mia. Now Davis takes it and looks to come the other way. Davis is in, trying to drive, and he will look to go across. Good play to Davis, though, to get it right back to him. He goes down low to Israel's. Centering, it's there. Scores! Stevie, Stevie, Stevie! Steven Weddle scores his first OJHL playoff goal for the Oakville Blade. This game is opening up in a big way for both teams. Ricketts centering. What a pass. Israel's breakaway. The move. Scores! 
What a goal for the Alaska Fairbanks commit, the assistant captain, Emerson Israels, with an absolute dandy. Download Alliance, Jack Lyons centering, scores! The double jacks combine as the, that puck popped up like a jack in a box. And it's Jack Ricketts from Jack Lyons. 6-1 on the 40th shot of the game. It's all over. Well, like Smith hits it in. A chance here can develop, but the Blades will look to take it. And, is, and Ricketts finds Israels. Breakaway, Israels. A chance back in. Rebound. That was Mamma Mia, This is Fire Talk with Nicholas Fiore. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next episode.